Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host, Michael, doing one here on St. John Henry Newman and um, his comments on the syllabus of errors. And I have several applications for why we're doing this, but um, first of all, if you have not read the syllabus of errors, you need to go and do so now, immediately. <laughs> push, push pause on this video. Well, you can push pause. I don't know. Can you push pause on a live video on YouTube? I haven't tried, but <laughs> uh, leave the video, go read the syllabus of errors, then come back. That would be my recommendation or stick around and you can uh, ask questions and all that, but then go back and read this right afterwards. Um, definitely want to do so. Of course, this was something written. Um, well, I, I don't want to tip my hand too much here. Let me rephrase this. This was a document released in the 19th century, mid 19th century by Pope Pius the ninth, who is actually one of my favorite popes, oddly enough. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody knows why, I mean, y'all can always put it in the chat. Anybody want to take a wild guess why Pope Pius the ninth is, uh, one of my favorite popes wild guess there. I'll give y'all just a second to post it. If not, I'll go ahead and give it over Pope Pius the ninth well the reason why is because he's the first one to use the term magisterium in the way that we use it today <laughs> a little arbitrary right but I, I like again magisterial studies which is partly why we're doing this but I also think that there are some important applications because when we think of the syllabus of errors, a lot of times we think that it is infallible, that it's definitive, that it was taught ex cathedra or something like that. Um, and that's not true at all. Now, I'm not saying that I reject anything in the syllabus of errors. I'm just trying to say that we need to recognize this is not something taught necessarily definitively. Um, it, it's not like this is an instance of something that's ex cathedra. What's curious about it is <clears throat> it is a document compiling different allocutions, papal allocutions, encyclicals, um, letters, different little bits from an allocution or a letter to somebody or, you know, and it takes them and kind of somewhat modifies the language. It doesn't literally quote it verbatim. It takes a snippet from each one of those uh, documents and somewhat rephrases it, restates it, and then gives you the reference, you know, where, where this came from. And it doesn't say, you know, if anybody rejects this, let them be anathema or something like that. Um, it just simply gives you the reference. And again, what it's doing is it is it is condemning uh, 80 different propositions. It's not attaching an anathema to any of them, uh, but it is condemning 80 different propositions grabbed from you know bits and pieces here and there, extracts from letters, allocutions, encyclicals, pretty low level magisterial teachings. Um, if, if the original sources in some cases were magisterial at all, um, you know, we would have to go and look specifically at each one of them to determine that. But if they are, they're, they're kind of low level, like a papal encyclical or an allocution. Those are pretty low level, um, expressions of the papal magisterium. The, the only reservation I have is with some of the letters. We would have to go back and look at the context of the letters to see if, um, if they're um, exercising the magisterium. So what's curious is none of the propositions that it condemns, it, it, it's, a, it, it's as if we tend to think that each one of these propositions are definitively condemned, and yet none of the propositions condemned there have any greater weight by being in the syllabus of errors than they previously had when they were delivered in a letter or an encyclical or an allocution. It's a lot like the current in catechism of the Catholic Church, and the syllabus has been compared to it in this way. The current catechism of the Catholic Church does not add any magisterial weight to anything that is in it. Um, it 
has the same magisterial weight that it had prior to its insertion in the catechism, its weight is determined by whatever document it is uh, citing, whatever the source is. So if it's if something in the catechism is coming from something that's non-definitive, it remains non-definitive. If it's coming from something that was previously taught definitively, say at an ecumenical council or something that was taught ex cathedra, it, it still retains that same level. It's still definitive. It's still ex cathedra. It's still a solemn definition of a ecumenical council. It, it retains the same magisterial weight. Same thing for the propositions condemned in the syllabus of errors. They're condemned, and yet they're not condemned definitively. They are condemned in the same, uh, with the same degree and weight as they were previously expressed in whatever document it's citing. What's also interesting is that the document is not signed by the Pope. That's going to impact the weight of the syllabus of errors itself. It's not signed by the Pope. It's, it's written, you know, as if the Pope is saying this, but he, he nowhere signs off on this. Now, I'm sure this is done under the auspices of the Pope, but the point is he never officially signs off on it. So very, very technically speaking, what Newman's going to do, as I'm going to show here in a moment, and I agree with him, is he's going to show, very technically speaking, the syllabus of errors in and of itself here doesn't carry any magisterial weight. The only magisterial weight that it carries is whatever is being quoted in those original sources and whatever weight they had. There's no new additional weight here because he doesn't even sign off on it as an exercise of the papal magisterium. And, and so what Newman's going to do is Newman doesn't really have a problem with any of the propositions in there. He's just going to say, look, this is um, not really signed off by the Pope. So you, you can't really say that one is bound to accept the syllabus of errors uh, definitively. That That's for sure. Um, but even as an act of the magisterium, he's going to question whether or not it, it should be accepted as an act of the magisterium because the Pope really never signed off on, on this thing. That's important because then when we're talking about maybe comparing some of the propositions in the syllabus of errors with perhaps some of the propositions in Dignitatis Humanae by the Second Vatican Council and Ecumenical Council, just strictly speaking, one proposition in the syllabus of errors that might go back to an, a papal allocution is not going to outweigh an ecumenical council, right? I, now, I'm not saying that there's any necessary contradictions between the syllabus of errors and Vatican II and Dignitatis Humanae. I'm not, I'm not willing to concede that yet. But what I am trying to say is that um, it is not necessarily... Uh, the case that somehow, if there were a contradiction, that the syllabus of errors would outweigh Dignitatis Humanae. Just all other things being equal, it, it would actually be Dignitatis Humanae that would outweigh a papal allocution, even if it's reiterated in the syllabus of errors because the syllabus of errors doesn't add any additional weight to it. And a papal allocution is not going to be higher than an ecumenical council. So <clears throat> that is important to consider when we have these discussions, um, because you will try to see people do two things. Number one, treat the syllabus of errors as if it's infallible. And then number two, assume that there's a contradiction between some of its propositions and dignitatis humanae and then say, well, we have to then assent to dignitatis, I'm sorry, to the syllabus of errors. And it's just, it's clear that, that that's definitely not, not the case. All right. So let's read what Newman has to say here. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read some of the more important sections. I think this is important 
because again, we tend to think of the syllabus of errors as this definitive document. It's this infallible exercise of the magisterium, and it just simply is not, and we don't need to treat it as such. Um, again, if, if it's quoting, for example, let me put it this way. If it is quoting from a papal allocution, and the syllabus of errors doesn't add any weight to it, it retains whatever magisterial weight that it had in the papal allocution. That's pretty low level, right? Why treat that like it's infallible, but then, but then reject Pope Francis's papal allocutions that might say some things that you don't agree with? On what basis do you reject one and assent to the other? On what basis do you treat one as infallible and treat another one as dismissible? Now, I am saying I, what I, I'm what I'm not saying is that you you couldn't maybe question some things in in the papal allocutions of Pope Francis. That's that's not what I'm saying. I, I think that you can question some things in the uh, allocutions of Pope Francis. But the point is, you can't treat the allocutions of Pius the Ninth as definitive, and yet just completely ignore the allocutions of Pope, Pope Francis, they, they're going to have the same weight, um, all things being considered. I mean, equal, all other things being equal, um, it's going to be the case that they're of equal status, um, it, neither of which is definitive. So if we, if, if we don't treat Pope Francis's allocutions as definitive, we, we shouldn't be doing the same with Pope Pius IX or the syllabus of errors whenever it quotes an allocution of Pope Pius IX. That's one of my points there. Um, let me pull it up here. I had it, but um, moved on me. There it is. Again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is just from a section to uh, his letter to the Duke of Norfolk. Scrolling down a little bit. All right, here we go. The syllabus then is to be received with profound submission. Submission. In other words, not necessarily some kind of um, ascent as far as the, the ascent of faith, but profound submission to be obeyed as having been sent by the Pope's authority to the bishops of the world. It certainly comes to them with his indirect ex extrinsic sanctions. I mean, he's, he's aware of this, right? He, he told them to send this thing out. But intrinsically and viewed in itself, it is nothing more than a digest of certain errors made by an anonymous writer. That, that's true. We don't know exactly who wrote it, um, but it, it does indirectly have the approval of the Pope, but he never signs off on it intrinsically, internally speaking. There's nothing that would actually make this a papal document. There would be nothing on the face of it to show that the Pope had ever even seen it, page by page, unless the imprimatur implied in the Cardinal's letter had been an evidence of this. It has no mark or seal put upon it, which is a pretty big deal. That's a big deal. Um, marks, seals, papal seals, uh, whether you're using lead or ink or something like that, those are important because they tell us what kind of weight this carries, papal weight, magisterial weight. Um, who is its author? Some select theologian or high official, doubtless. Can it be Cardinal Antonelli himself? No, surely, or not surely. Um, anyhow, it is not the Pope, and I do not see my way to accept it for what it is not. I do not speak as if I had any difficulty in recognizing and condemning the errors. So he doesn't have a problem condemning any of the errors in it. Which it catalogs. Um, hold on. I do not have any difficulty in recognizing and condemning the errors of which it catalogs. Did the Pope himself bid me? But he has not yet done so. And he cannot delegate his magisterium to another. Which is true. He can't delegate delegate his magisterium to another. What he can do is have another person write something, and then he signs off on it personally, 
and then it becomes part of the papal magisterium. That that happens all the time. But he can't just hey say, hey, uh, hey, look, take my take my papal infallibility, you know, uh mechanism here. Take that from me here. Take that. There you go. Now uh you hold that for me and you can go use it. And uh th- this authority that I have to teach as the Pope, yeah, hold that for me. He can't <laughs> he can't designate it to somebody else. It has to be exercised personally. He can take the words of somebody else in the document that they wrote and then make it his own. Yeah, he can do that. But that's not what happened here with the syllabus of errors because he never signs off on it. So he can't treat it like it's some papal um, document, let alone something definitive. I do not speak as if I had any difficulty in recognizing condemning the errors, which it catalogs, did the Pope himself bid me. But he has not as yet done so, and he cannot delegate his magisterium to another. I wish, with St. Jerome, to speak with the successor of the fisherman and the disciple of the cross. I assent to that which the Pope propounds in faith and morals, but it must be he speaking officially, personally, and immediately, and not anyone else who has a hold over me. The syllabus is not an official act. Because it is not signed, for instance, with Datum Rome Pius, um, Pope Pius the Ninth, or Sub Annulo uh, Piscatoris, you know, under under the ring of the fisherman, or in some other way. It is not a person. It is not a personal, for he does not address his venerable uh, brothers or dialecto filio, or speak as Pius Episcopus, you know, B- Bishop Pius. It is not an immediate for it comes to the bishops only through the cardinal minister of state. If indeed the Pope should ever make that anonymous compilation directly his own, then of course I should bow to it and accept it as strictly his. I mean, again, he doesn't have a problem um, accepting the syllabus of heirs if the Pope were to make this uh, something that belonged to his magisterium. He's just pointing out that technically this doesn't belong to the papal magisterium. And so again, it's it's just odd that so many people today want to quote the syllabus of errors, and um, and and that's okay because it's helpful, and the the source that it's drawn from those are helpful, but again, not definitive. It says he might have done so, he might still so do, or still ah, keep uh, misreading here. He might do so still. Again, he might issue a fresh list of propositions in addition and pronounce them to be errors. And I should take that condemnation to be of dogmatic authority because I believe him to be appointed with his divine master to determine in the detail of faith and morals what is true and what is false. But such an act of his would formally authenticate. He would speak in his own name as Leo X or Innocent the Eleventh did by bull or letter apostolic. Or if he wished to speak less authoritatively, he could speak through the sacred congregation. Um, But the syllabus makes no claim to be acknowledged as the word of the Pope. Moreover, if the Pope drew up the catalog, as it may be called, because the syllabus here means catalog, he would have pronounced it in some definite judgment on the propositions themselves. What gives cogency to this remark is that a certain number of bishops and theologians, when a syllabus was in contemplation, did wish for a formal act on the part of the Pope, and in consequence they drew up for his consideration the sort of document on which, on which, if he so willed, he might suitably stamp his infallible sanction, but he did not accede to their prayer. The composition is contained in the recu- uh, what is this? Recuil des Allocutions, etc., and it's far more than mere collection of errors. It is headed Thesis uh, Ad Apostolicum Sede, Elite cum uh, censuris, etc. And each error from first to last has the ground of its condemnation marked upon it. He goes on a little bit later. Here I am led to interpose a remark. It is plain then that there are those near or with access to the Holy Father who would, if they could, go much further in the way of assertion and command than the divine essentia, which overshadows him wills or permits so that his acts and his words on doctrinal substance or subjects must be carefully scrutinized and weighed 
before we can be sure what really he has said. Utterances which must be received as coming from an infallible voice are not made every day. Indeed, they are very rare, and and that is true. Um, I, I wouldn't say rare as some people might suggest, but still, on the whole, relatively rare compared to non-definitive papal teachings. And those which are by some persons affirmed or assumed to be such do not always turn out what they are said to be. Nay, even such as are really dogmatic must be read by definite rules and by traditional principles of interpretation, which are as cogent and unchangeable as the Pope's own decisions themselves. What I have to say presently will illustrate this truth. Meanwhile, I use the circumstances which has led to my mentioning it for another purpose here. When intelligence which we receive from the Rome startles and pains us, from its seemingly harsh or extreme character, let us learn to have some little faith and patience and not take for granted that all that is reported is the truth. Oh boy, that's very applicable to today. <laughs> People don't want to do that though. They want to, as soon as they hear some noise or, you know, and uh, I say noise, I meant to say news, but that actually works even better. As soon as they hear some noise uh, about the Pope, they immediately want to report on it and it's not always very accurate so <laughs> ends up being problematic well a whole lot more can be said we can read um more from him and i encourage you to read the rest of it but um i think suffice it to say he is rightly noting that this is not technically an act of the papal magisterium um it's not something that is definitive and um, you know, if the Pope wished to make this his own, why didn't he sign off on it? Why is there no seal, lead or ink or something else? Uh, why is it not dated? I think those are really good questions. That being said, I don't think that we just should outright dismiss it either. I think that it's important and we should read what is in there because it does indirectly come from a Pope. And it's just merely repeating different things that are taught uh, elsewhere by popes, albeit in low-level documents, and in a qualified case or a qualified sense, because it's not directly quoting those documents. It's somewhat paraphrasing them. And so when you go and look at the original wording, it's actually a little different than the paraphrase that you get uh, in the syllabus of errors. This should all be kept in mind whenever we are reading it today. Whenever you see somebody throw out a quote that has, you know, one of the uh, condemned propositions in the syllabus of errors, it doesn't even tell us condemned with what kind of censor. It, it, I mean, is this offensive to pious ears or is this heresy? Which is another thing that Newman brings up in the letter a little bit later on. He's bringing up the, the problem that, well, you can condemn a proposition a different way different ways. I mean, some are condemned as heretical and some are just merely condemned as offensive to pious ears. And what's offensive to pious ears a hundred years ago could actually be taught a uh, hundred years later and it's no longer offensive to pious ears. So it could be subject to that censor at that time and then no longer subject to that censor later. Now, something condemned as heretical is always going to be heretical. That's not going to change according to time. But some of the lower level censors, like offensive to pious ears, that could change over time. And there have been cases where that has changed over time. And the problem is the syllabus of errors doesn't even give us well, okay, this is condemned, but with what kind of censor? With what level? Is this just merely offensive to pious ears, or is it something a little higher than that, or is it all the way up to heresy? It doesn't tell us. Keep that in mind next time somebody's quoting the syllabus of errors to you, thinking that that somehow settles the debate. It doesn't. And keep that in mind next time somebody quotes the syllabus of errors to you, thinking that that somehow um, refutes uh, something in Dignitatis Humanae, or overturns, or I should say, is to be given assent instead of Dignitatis Humanae. doesn't necessarily follow. Uh, what is What does offensive to pious ears mean, Kasman asks? Believe it or not, um, oh, and, and I see your question there, uh, NYM, I'll, I'll get to that also in just a second. Uh, Kasman, you ask a good question there. Why, what exactly is offensive to pious ears? What does that censor mean? Um, there's a really good dissertation 
I think from uh, Switzerland and I have on the shelf over there that I need to read. But the gist of it is that there has never been an official guide to papal censors. They just started using this. The first time it was used was at the Council of Constance. And after that, Pope started using them as well. And there was no official, hey, um, whenever we start saying this <laughs> offensive to pious ears, well, here's what that means. There was no official explanation on what any of this meant. Which should tell you something. That should tell you something. That should tell you it means exactly what it sounds like. So if it's a, a heretical, it's it's heretical. If it's offensive to pious ears, it means just that. It's offensive to pious ears. It means nothing more than that. So the theological censors mean exactly what they sound like they mean. Uh, because there has never been any kind of um, formal definitions, uh, uh, definition of them. And... They just expected you to know what it meant, so it had to mean what it means on the face of it, on the surface. So it had to be what it means face value. Okay, um, so the St. Jerome Study Bible that I was working on, uh, why is it no longer in print? Is it a good Bible? Um, you know, it, it's been a while. I, I put that project on hold, and... Uh, whenever I got my master's, I started working on my master's and I haven't had any free time to work on that project since then. So I have not completed the St. Jerome study Bible and probably won't for a very long time, if ever, unless I can get a team to help me compile it. And I just kind of, you know, edit it and go over it and um, supervise it and they do it. I mean, it will be a long time before I would you know, be able to compile that. Uh, I got to second Samuel and that was it. Um, this is just too much. So sorry about that. Um, um, so is offensive to pious ears, basically saying the, uh, a cuss word in public. No, but it's basically saying, something that is offensive to Christians. In other words, the doctrine, the teaching is offensive. Um, it might not be heretical, but it's offensive sounding. I would give examples, but they're going to be offensive. And so I'm not going to give you any examples. <laughs> um, just, just, just know that it means that somebody is saying something to be true, but it might not be heretical, but it is offensive to anybody who is a, a pious person, a pious Christian, to even listen to that kind of garbage. At the time, it's offensive. That doesn't mean that other things considered 100, 200 years later, it wouldn't be, it, it would still be offensive. There have been some exceptions there. Um, no, I'm not going to give you all examples because it's offensive to pious ears. It's going to be something that is, um, you know, that, that shouldn't be discussed in, in, in public, in my opinion. You know, that that's the purpose. These are things that um, I would say use your imagination, but don't don't use your imagination. That's basically all you need to know. These are some some things that, you know, I remember at. Somebody asking a question about Jesus. It was a Muslim asking questions about Jesus and how his body works. Let's just keep it at that. Uh, how his body works, certain aspects of his body. And, and well, if he's really a human, did he do this? Did he do that? And it was offensive to pious ears, the stuff that he was asking. Um, that, that's what we're talking about when we, when we use that kind of sensor. Um, at least that could be one of the things we're talking about, not necessarily always. Um, what translation was the study Bible in? I mean, I was um, using the Dewey Reims. Uh, didn't the syllabus use definitive language? I'll read it later, but I've heard as much. I would be interested in saying I've, I've, 
you know, read it several times and I don't recall where the definitive language is. If you can point that out to me, I, I'd be interested in seeing that. And so would have John Henry Newman. He would have been interested in seeing that as well. Um, that being said, sure. Send it my way. Send me what you think might be definitive in there and let's talk about it. Let's say there's something in there that sounds definitive. Did the Pope sign off on it? So it doesn't matter. I mean, it would be no different than me writing something and saying something definitive. You know, it would be no different than me just saying, um, I decree and I define or, you know, um, it, it doesn't mean anything. I'm not the Pope. I'm I'm not a bishop, but even a, a, an individual bishop could not definitively teach something anyway. So um, you're going to have to show that not only does it teach something definitively, but it is um, explicitly um, affirmed by the papal magisterium. Uh, let's see. I'm looking through, seeing if I see anything else. I don't saw something. Hold on. Yeah, it's saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't want to burn heretics offensive to pious ears. The problem is he uses a global censor there, Pope Leo X. And uh, Exerge Domine, he uses a global censor. So he doesn't tell us which proposition is which, which censor. He just uses a global sensor. All of these propositions are either heretical, this or this or that, or offensive to pious ears. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> he just gives you a million different propositions. Okay. So one of these is heretical. One of them's offensive to pious ears. One of them's this, one of them's that. Okay, but which one is which? Well, he doesn't tell you. So <laughs> um, I think, in my opinion, the Holy Spirit doesn't want, uh, He do, it actually doesn't say the Holy Spirit doesn't want to burn. Um, it's something to the effect of it is against the will of the Holy Spirit to burn heretics, I think was the proposition. And he condemns that under one of those condemnations or one of those censors. And we don't know which censor. I think it's more under something like offensive to pious ears or maybe one of the little higher censors. I don't think that that's heresy or anything like that um you would you would have to show well where has that been definitively taught so it can't be heresy right but the problem is people a lot of people don't know what a global sensor is and so they just read that and think oh well it's infallible because i mean he's he's saying over here previously that he's using his authority and it sounds like he's speaking ex cathedra which i believe he is he is speaking ex cathedra but you can speak ex cathedra and determine that something's offensive to pious ears, ex cathedra. Yeah. The extraordinary papal magisterium applies to the lower level censors. That's been established. But a lot of people, again, don't know what a global censor is. So they just read that and think, oh man, this all this, all this is 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 dogma. <laughs> and it doesn't work that way. Um I, I think when I was reviewing James, uh not James, but um Jordan Cooper, I, I showed that he um, he kind of had that view as well because he d doesn't know what a global sensor is. So he kind of had that impression as well. And, and so I kind of had to explain that in one of the episodes. Mm. Speaking of which, we're supposed to have, uh, I almost said James Jordan, that reminded me we're supposed to have Peter Lightheart on. I'm trying to think, did he get back to me about a date? Because I know some of y'all been asking me about it, but I forget if he got back to me or not. Let me check real quick while I'm thinking about it. Uh, let's see. Oh, I think I had, oh, I remember what it is. Um, I'm going to be meeting with him on uh he's gonna be coming to my area i'll meet with him on the 21st and then we'll discuss dates for him to come on the show so y'all stay tuned for that he, sh he should be coming on um, 
I think he just kind of wants to meet me and get to know me and feel me out and see see what the show would be like. So, what is a global sensor, uh, Casman asks. Well, you know, instead of saying, okay, X proposition is condemned with this sensor, instead of lining them all out, which would be the most helpful thing to do, what some popes did was kind of they took the lazy way out and they, they would list a whole bunch of uh, condemned propositions, but then they, would, they wouldn't they would tell you which proposition is condemned with which sensor. It, this one's heretical. This one's slightly less than heretical, but is against Catholic dogma. This one is this. This one's this. Um, instead of doing that, they would just say, all of the following con- propositions are condemned under uh, the following, um, under one of the following uh, censors, rash, offensive to pious ears, heretical, against Catholic doctrine. And, and they would list a whole bunch of them ranging from the the least to the greatest and wouldn't tell you which one is which <laughs> it would just say well it falls under one of those <laughs> uh, okay well thank you at least now i know that they're condemned in some way but that doesn't really help me whenever i'm trying to look at a specific proposition and ask whether or not it's heretical or is it just rash which one is it um and then in other cases they wouldn't do these global sensors. They would do line by line. Okay, here's here's what the sensor is. They would give you these individual sensors. Those are the helpful ones that I I found. Um, and and those are also why I believe that uh, Gasser could talk about thousands on thousands of exercises of papal infallibility because I think he he's thinking about global sensors. Um. Okay. I'm looking. What else y'all got? Yeah, plenty more coming on the death penalty. If the not burning heretics fell under the not pious ears, uh, could we use that to disagree with the death penalty change i think you can still ask well how is it that you know what pope francis is saying in this papal allocution and the revision to the catechism how can that be said in light of the fact that this was a condemned proposition you could ask that question you could also ask why is it that god commanded the death penalty in some cases in the new testament uh, old testament um so you could ask those questions, but I, I ultimately think that we were able to reconcile the revision. Uh, doc, doctrinally speaking, we're able to reconcile um, the preconciliar understanding, and not just preconciliar, but even postconciliar. Um, we're able to reconcile Pope Francis's re- revision, doctrinally speaking, with pre-Pope Francis. I, I'm not sure that everything that is in it factually or practically or is 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 somehow right but the the doctrine as far as doctrinally speaking i don't think there's any substantial rupture here more to come on that i'm going to be doing a lot on that because that's probably going to be the test case that i'm going to use in my dissertation (sighs) okay I've been told that the lap mass has more grace than the Novus Ordo. Seems silly to me, but is there anything to that claim? I have not seen anything to that claim, and I don't think that that is a tenable position, um, respectfully. I know some uh, very pious and holy people uh, recently have said that, and so, I mean, I would respectfully disagree and say that I, I don't think that's a tenable position, and I think it tends to undermine the church elsewhere. The church, by implementing the ordinary form, is implicitly saying that it's on par with this extraordinary form. By implementing these reforms, it's implicitly saying that. It doesn't explicitly say that to my knowledge, but it's implicitly saying it's on par 
I, I'm not aware of anything saying that there's more graces that come from uh, the extraordinary form. You would have to argue that by reason because there's nothing in the church magisterially that's going to back that up. Um, you'd have to argue that by reason. But I would argue by reason the exact opposite. I would argue by the church putting its approbation on the ordinary form, that's implicitly the church saying that this is on par with the uh, liturgy prior to the reforms. And if it's on par, it's going to have the same amount of graces, um, at least potentially, right? Potentially. More, more importantly, though, if we're, if we're going to now talk in the realm of more graces, here's a problem that I'm going to have to uh, present to the Latin Mass community. As much as I appreciate the Latin Mass, if we're going to talk in these terms, here's a dilemma for you. For nearly a thousand years, the Catholic Church communicated infants. It gave infants the Holy Eucharist. For nearly a thousand years. And it was pretty much by accidental circumstances, by an accident of history, that it went away. Um, in the Latin Rite. It did not go away in the Eastern Rites for the most part. In the Latin Rite, it was pretty much an accident that it went away. Um, now, you might say, well... Infant communion is not necessary for an infant's salvation. Baptism is what's necessary. I agree. I agree. It's uh, Infant communion, uh, the Eucharist is not necessary for their salvation. They're, they're already saved through baptism. Um, but that's not what the Eucharist is for in, in their case uh, entirely. It's not to remove their original sin and bring them from a state of uh, deprivation uh, to a state of uh, being in communion with the, the the new Adam, as Trent puts it. It, it, it's the Eucharist is more than that. It's, it's, um, it helps divinize the individual, not that there isn't already some divinization there through baptism, but it, it increases it. And there are extra graces that are given in the Eucharist that are communicated to the infant that are not given in, uh, baptism. So it's nourishment. It strengthens that individual. It gives them extra graces, and so I wouldn't put it in terms of, well, what, what, you know, what's the big deal? These infants are already saved. Yes, they are. But it's kind of like saying, oh, I'm baptized. I'm already saved. I never need to receive the Eucharist. I can, you know, just, hey, as, as long as I don't commit any mortal sins, I'm good to go, right? <laughs> Technically, if you don't commit any mortal sins after your baptism, you're not going to hell, sure. But that's not exactly the point there there are other graces that are available through the eucharist that you need to be um you know using that you need to take advantage of so my point is this we have been given these graces to infants in the latin rite for a very long time for nearly a thousand years i mean as late as aquinas's age they're still communicating infants in the Latin Rite in some places. So as late as the 1200s. By an accident of history, it stopped in the Latin Rite. Does that mean that the Latin Rite, especially as it is expressed in the Tridentine Mass, is depriving infants of grace compared to the... Uh, say, Latin liturgy in the ninth century? If, if we're going to talk in terms of one offering more grace than another, I'm going to ask that question. I know that's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable, but I'm going to ask the question, is the Tridentine Mass depriving infants of some graces that it previously didn't deprive them of? And does that mean that a pre-Tridentine liturgy was somehow superior or offered more graces than the Tridentine Mass? Now, I have answers to those things, but I'm just saying, if we're going to put things in this category, in this realm of uh, ordinary form has less grace than the extraordinary form, I'm going to say, wait, why is the extraordinary form, as understood you know, by Trent, 
why why is that the standard why not the 11th century roman liturgy why isn't that the standard why isn't the 5th century roman liturgy the standard why are we assuming that the extraordinary form of the latin mass of the tridentine liturgy is somehow the pinnacle and height of all liturgy and why are we assuming that it's the height of the roman rite to begin with i would say these are questions that i would like to have answered um, because I think they're very relevant when it comes to the discussion of uh, which one offers more grace. Now, um, again, at the end of the day, um, I, I, I think the, putting it in even in these terms is not very helpful because it's going to, it, it kind of is, is saying, okay, well, the church isn't uh, offering me what it used to offer as far as preparing me for um communion with God. And I think that that would lead to some very serious problems if we were to adopt that position. And I think that when the Eastern Orthodox hear you say that, they're probably going to take advantage of it and say, yeah, man, look look how bad this is. Y'all don't even offer grace anymore like y'all used to. That's why you need to come to us over here. We're not doing that to y'all. We're not playing around with the liturgy like y'all did. They're going to eat that up. So, I don't know. <clears throat> and, of course, here I'm talking about the ordinary form as it's properly done. I understand in many parishes it's not done the way it should be done. I'm not talking about liturgical abuses. I'm talking about the ordinary form done properly without liturgical abuses. Yeah, I think we can do an episode on um, penal substitutionary atonement. I saw that question there. Um, do you think active participation could be understood as a method of counter-revolution to anti-Catholic cultural claims saying that the church doesn't like laity? Um, a lot going on with that question. Active participation, yes, it is something internal, but it is also something external. It does include an element of externality to it. There's going to be some people who tell you otherwise. Yes, it is something internal. Yes, you do need to participate in the liturgy. But I think the Eastern churches have done a really good job at preserving um, an external participation from the laity as well. Um, they, they've done a much better job at preserving that, that than we have in the Latin Rite. I do think that the post-conciliar reforms of getting the laity um, more involved in some ways is good. But it has then been abused. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. I mean, we took something that was good because we were restoring that aspect to our liturgy. But then it got a, really abused where, you know, laity are trying to confect the Eucharist or uh, you, you have uh, women uh, altar servers or you have uh, women lectors and, and things like that. I think that yeah, we, we needed to get the laity more involved, and, and there are some um, ways that we could even get um, women involved liturgically, but I, I don't think that those were the best ways. Um, so I, I think it was good that we, we started to recognize we needed some active uh, participation, but it just wasn't done very well, and it's still not being done very well. And it's made a lot of people bitter towards this concept of active participation as a result. Mm. Yeah, somebody says as long as active participation doesn't mean I need to hold hands during the Our Father. Yeah, I'm I'm I refuse to hold people's hands in the Our Father. I'm not doing that. This isn't a, a hippie guitar mask. Get out of here. Don't try to hold my hand during the liturgy. <laughs> I don't know you. Don't do that. <laughs> now I understand. I mean, way back in the day, you know, for our second century, you had such a tight knit community that you did more than holding hands, right? You actually had an actual kiss of peace. Uh, but, I mean, with a lot of these Catholic churches, you don't know people that well. So, <laughs> please don't hold my hand. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't like that either. I don't, I don't think that's active participation. That's not active participation. That's just you being awkward. 
<laughs> uh, active participation is more me singing with the hymns and chants and things like that out loud. Uh, I think that's good. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And there had been some of those reforms taking place even before Sancta Sanctum Concilium in the Second Vatican Council. You had already had dialogue masses, for example, developing in the Latin Rite, which I think is a good thing. Um, all right, well, moving on. Yeah, at least we don't have a literal kiss of peace. Yeah, that, that was... I'm I'm not too happy. I mean, I'm not too upset that that one fell out of disuse and has been restricted pr primarily to the the priest. Uh, <laughs> so I'm I'm not uh, I'm not missing that one. It seems some prayers in the extraordinary form are objectively richer than prayers in the ordinary form. I could say that something might be um, richer, but I, what I'm not going to say is something offers more grace that that's what i'm not gonna that's the I, i'm gonna make a distinction there right i i think that i'm in agreement with you there there are some prayers that we need to recover from the latin mass um we, we need to recover a tremendous amount of it um i i'm in complete agreement with you there but i'm not gonna say that less grace is being offered because I, i'm still gonna say even in the ordinary form it's the prayer of the church so the same amount of grace is offered it's just not as externally uh beautiful if you will um uh, so i think that some fair criticism can be made about the ordinary form when it comes to the prayers truncating scripture readings truncating prayers um i, I don't think that should have been done not not the way that we did it no um at, at the same time, I'm not going to say that it's depriving people of, of graces that are available in the extraordinary form. Um, that, that really is a stain on your claim to be the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. If your church is that defective, um, I don't, I don't see it. Can I speak about communion in the hand? I've done that many times. Uh, what aspect of it? I don't prefer communion in the hand, even though I know that was the predominant way to do things for nearly a thousand years in the Latin Rite and the Eastern churches. I don't prefer communion in the hand. I definitely don't think that it is preferable in our current context now. I, I'm not in favor of it. I've seen... By receiving communion on my hand, I've seen the particles left on my hand after communicating. So um, I already know if I have particles on my hand afterwards, other people do, and they're just falling, ev falling everywhere, and we don't care about them. Now, I understand to a certain extent we're not going to be able to um, get every single particle, right? I mean, we, we breathe, and, and so there's going to be some particles that come out. I, I get that, but... I think the stuff that we can take care of, we need to take care of it and treat it properly and respectfully. And in today's age, when most people are just going to receiving communion flippantly and not concerned about those kinds of things, it's not a good idea to have communion on the hand. It's not objectively evil. It's not objectively immoral, but it's definitely not a really good idea right now because people are going to abuse that. And we're just we're just allowing for it to be abused easier and we shouldn't do that. <clears throat> so, um, definitely don't see it as preferable. I, I think in the Latin rite communion on the tongue would be preferable in the Eastern churches communion on the spoon. I, I think that's preferable. Um, I, and I also think that this, even though, Communion on, on the tongue was something that organically developed, you know, nearly a thousand years after Christ. We have had that tradition for a very long time, and, and I don't think that what we need to be doing is just completely changing the liturgy constantly. We, we really need to regain a sense of 
preserving that which has been handed down to us. The liturgy is not our plaything. It's not something for us to just start experimenting with. We, we need to really regain a sense of this is what has been handed down to me and I'm handing it down to others. And I'm not altering that. We really need to get back to that. Um, if you had an Eastern Catholic divine liturgy near you, do you think you'd attend? Yeah, I would even formally change my right, but I don't have any available, so I can do neither. Uh, stuck in the Latin right, for better or worse. And in some ways I feel for better, and in some ways I feel for worse. <laughs> So there's some things I love about the Latin Rite over the Eastern churches. Um, and then there's some things about the Latin Rite that I just think, man, <laughs> we're, 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 in, uh, we're in a mess right now. And the Eastern churches are doing a little bit better here. So Melanie says, I have a lot of Eastern Rite churches near me. Well, hey, you're, you're blessed. Uh, I'm over here living as a desert father, so I don't have that. Um, <laughs> a desert father of Louisiana's, <laughs> a bayou father, <laughs> a swamp father. We uh, we don't have a whole lot of that eastern rat stuff going on around here. Uh, not a lot of foreigners over here to even have something like that. So, um, anyways, I think we'll. We're coming up at the hour. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, Catholic Ben Shapiro, I see your question. I answered that earlier, so just uh, go back and watch the, the, the previous part of the video. Uh, a desert Cajun nuanced father. That's funny. <laughs> the Swamp Fathers. <laughs> uh, can I play Ordain a Lady video next comedy hour? Didn't I do that a long time ago, several years back? Didn't I do the Ordain a Lady video? I thought I did one years ago, like several years ago when the show first started. If I didn't, I'm confusing it when Todd Friel did it probably like 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I thought I did one. I'd have to go back and look and see. Um. Speaking as a woman, the ordain a lady video is an offense against me. But the question is, is it offensive to pious ears? That, that's the question in light of our discussion earlier. So. Um, were you Eastern Orthodox when you started the show? Yes. Yes, I was. Um, probably for a whole year, I was, I was Eastern Orthodox. Um, what else we got? Well, I'm seeing mostly comments, no more questions. So we'll, we'll probably leave it at that. Uh, anyways, just trying to see if there was anything updating. Yeah, we'll go ahead and leave it there though. I, again, as I always say, I really appreciate y'all watching. Thank you for your participation and interaction there in the uh, chat. Really enjoyed it. Uh, you always make the, the, the show fun. Um, so, And I saw quite a few requests there for uh, Comedy Hour, so we'll, we'll definitely have to do one soon. Um, I don't know what, what we have coming up on the schedule. Hold on. I know I have three shows on Saturday. That's going to be a long day. Uh, but I'm trying to think if I have a show tomorrow. Let me check. Otherwise, I can probably do a comedy hour. I do not have a show tomorrow. I can do a comedy hour. Um, and on Saturday, we have uh, Abuna Elias Shakur, which was the former Bishop of Nazareth in Galilee, coming on. We have Cy Kellett later on that day, the host of Catholic Answers. And then we have... A discussion between Andy and Louis Dizon um, on Islam. So uh, y'all, y'all stay tuned for Saturday, and then Sunday we have Kevin uh, Simmons' his uh, Fatima webinar. Really, really good stuff. So uh, y'all check that out. All right, y'all. Well, uh, that's gonna do it. Y'all can look forward to a comedy hour. 
tomorrow. Pray for me because I am trying to juggle a million things right now. I got my book that I'm trying to revise because I have some things I'm going to be doing with that. I got the dissertation I'm working on. I have two books I have to review for this weekend. Um, then my full-time job, my day job, I'll do in this show, everything else. So I'm just trying to juggle it all and um, definitely could use your prayers that I would accomplish them and do them well. Um, and, of course, as you all know, I'm also trying to get the show on a local uh, station. Uh, we've we've had some good support, good donations so far. I appreciate y'all, all of y'all who have donated so far. Thank you. It's definitely going to get us going. Uh, but for long term, we'll, we'll still need some more support if y'all are able. So go check out the GoFundMe on uh, social media. It's on my Facebook. It's on my Twitter. Uh, so go check those out, and um, you, you'll see where you you can donate to that contribution. Because I'm trying to get the show on a local station uh, so we can kind of evangelize some uh, people in this territory who are mostly Baptist and charismatic. So they really need the Catholic faith here. So uh, trying to evangelize them by putting some basic uh, introductions to Catholicism kind of videos on, on the, on the TV channel and TV stations and uh, just kind of seeing how, how that goes. So check out the GoFundMe or become a patron, um, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. It should be at the bottom of your screen there. And then also you can make a one-time donation at reason and If you want to do that there, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll be taking the funds from those donations for these TV, uh, station spots. I'm going to start out with one local station and then maybe branch out into some of the bigger uh, stations, those are going to be a lot more expensive though. So right now I'm just kind of going with the one that, that I can afford. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. All right. Once again, thank y'all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share this on your social media. Till next time. God bless you all.